Okay, so uh, very good. This is the last lecture. So uh, in this uh, summer course. So I thought maybe because we've been doing this uh, analytic continuations, maybe we also cover a little bit of uh, this topic, analytic continuation. of L functions. I mean, Dirichlet L functions. Um, so what's the setup? So we fix an integer N. <clears throat> and we looked at group of integers modulo N. And then we define a Dirichlet character to be a uh, multiplicative character of the multiplicative group of Zn, the group of invertible elements here, to C star. So this is a Dirichlet character. And then we extended this uh, chi, <coughs> first of all, to all of Zn by defining it to be 0 on uh, the rest of Zn, and then we composed it with the quotient map. Again, so all of these things again are called chi. And so then the Dirichlet L function of uh, this character L of S chi, character modulo N, was defined to be some chi n over n to the s and from one to infinity. So this we did a long time ago when we were proving uh, Dirichlet's theorem on uh, primes in arithmetic progressions. Okay, so now what we want to do with this, of course, this chi is fully multiplicative in the sense that chi of nm is equal to chi of n, chi of m. And you immediately observe that then there is an Euler product formula here, one minus chi p divided by p to the s minus one over all primes p, similar to Riemann's uh, zeta function. Now, this function, as we observed already, long time ago, this is obviously holomorphic in real part of S bigger than one, simply because chi is a bounded uh, function. So this is uh, actually absolute value of chi is less than or equal to one, is either zero or one. So this is really majorized by Riemann zeta function in absolute value. So this is at least Polymorphic here. Now, in general, of course, it doesn't have to be uh, convergent uh, below real part of S equal to one. And that's the reason for this is that it can happen that if chi equal to chi zero is the trivial character, So trivial ca character is the character that takes value one on, 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 the, on, on, on this multiplicative group and of course zero on other places. If chi is such a trivial character, then uh, this is uh, always either one or zero depending if, uh, uh, so, so let me write it what happens in this case then, L of S and chi, actually becomes Riemann zeta function. But then there is uh, some factors of those primes that divide n, at those primes, uh, uh, they are missing from the uh, Euler product of L. So we put them in and then we divide by those. So those that we have to divide are exactly these terms, one minus one over P to the S minus one, E divides n, or, 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 or prime factors of n. All right, so this shows that, of course, 
this L in this case, when chi is chi zero, cannot be uh, convergent uh, for real part of S equal to one or less than one. But we also observe that if chi is, is not a trivial character, then the series is convergent in real part of S positive. is actually convergent and holomorphic in a real part of S positive. And in fact, a crucial uh, part of the proof of um, Dirichlet's theorem was to show that in this case, L of S and chi at S equal to one were different from zero. Okay. Now, but uh, so today our concern is to um, see, yes, how we can extend or if we can extend this L um, analytically um, to below real part of S equal to zero and what's the situation. And in fact, we will see that in this case, uh, when chi is not chi zero and Basically, it can be analytically continued, and there is also a functional equation, so we want to see that as well. Okay, so, but before doing that, just let's look at one more example. You get a feeling of uh, how things are in this case uh, for non-trivial character. So let n be equal to four, and then in this case, uh, of course, that four is, Zero, one, two, three, modulo four, and uh, Z four. There are only two elements. Is a group of cyclic group of order two written multiplicatively, and uh, there is only one non-trivial character. Uh, so this non-trivial character is chi of one equal to one, chi of three is equal to much, right? Good, so uh, then we extended it, we, we extended to, to the whole set of integers, then uh, of course, then if uh, say n is equal to 4k, this chi of n is equal to zero, if n is equal to 4k plus one, chi of n is equal to one, if n is equal to 4k plus 2, chi of n is equal to 0 again. And if n is equal to 4k plus 3, chi of n is equal to negative 1. And from this, we got uh, this thing for the L function, explicit formula, which is 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 5 to the s minus 1 over seven to the S and so on, right? We get all these things. And we check that, by the way, that L of one and chi, uh, yeah, is equal to pi over four. Uh, but obviously, I mean, uh, there's no easy way to see that this function can be analytically continued. Uh, Below real part of s equal to zero, and much less, uh, we don't know uh, if there is a functional equation for this L function or not. This is not clear. But uh, what kind of functional equation this could have? Uh, so that's what we're going to do today, and. Uh, the way to go with this is the way we did it for Riemann zeta function and the way we uh, did it for um, uh, at least one example of uh, Dedekind zeta function, namely for the Gaussian uh, integers. So the idea is to find a suitable theta function and then uh, we use Mellin transform. We find a functional equation for that suitable theta function using Poisson summation formula, in other words, we use harmonic analysis. We find a suitable theta function with corresponding functional equation. Then we use Mellin transform. 
we relate that uh, theta function to this L function, and then the functional equation for theta function gives us the functional equation for this L function. Now, there, there are many, many steps and details here that uh, makes things uh, difficult in general. So let me just explain at least one big case uh, how we can proceed. Okay, so so uh, so now the idea then is um, relate a lot of sky to a suitable theta. via melin translate. Okay. Well, to see what kind of theta function we need, we just write this. Uh, I mean, again, the formula always is like this. This is the formula for the uh, for, for lambda to power mi mi minus s e to the minus lambda t t to the s d t over t. And uh, if you put uh, lambda to be n squared, then we get n to the power negative 2s equal to 1 over gamma of s. I put lambda equal to n squared, so you get that. And then uh, we have zero to infinity e to the minus n squared t, t to the s dt over t. And then we can multiply this by chi n and add. So we get sum chi n n to the power negative 2s. And uh, and belonging to Z, this is equal to one over gamma of S integral zero to infinity. So we get sum exponential of minus N squared T and here we need I N. Um, so it looks like we have to put chi n squared here, maybe. Uh, no, 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 I, I put, they say I put, no, 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 that's okay, chi n, that's fine. And then we put ts dt over t. So what suggests itself here is that maybe we have to take theta chi t to be, so this is over n in z, to be some, uh, chi n exponential of minus, of course, there is this normalization by pi, which is important, like in the standard theta function, so e to the minus pi n squared t, n belonging to z, but um, right here, sorry, there's no n in z, this is n bigger than equal to 1, so n from one to infinity, yes. And this is m from one to infinity. But theta functions, uh, in order to use the symmetry of the integers and Fourier analysis on integers, we need to uh, sum over all of the integers. So now to relate to this sum, to that one-sided sum, we need to relate chi n and chi minus n. So if now chi n, equal to chi minus n. In other words, if the character is even, if the character is even, then we can do that. But if the character is odd, actually this sum is uh, zero. So we have to think of a different theta function. But at least if chi is even, we can write the symmetric sum namely theta function, uh, I mean, this, this half thing. But by the way, chi of zero is always zero, so there is no zero here. 
there's no zero term here. So we get sum uh, chi n e to the minus pi n squared t and from one to infinity, that's equal to theta chi t divided by two. Okay. Now, one thing we need to know is to, we need to know the functional equation for this theta function. So, and for this, we have to use again, Poisson summation formula. So, uh, equation for uh, theta twisted by of t. So the, the, the key here again, I mean, one of the main ideas is to use Poisson summation formula. And n belong to z equal to sum about n and belonging to z for a suitable or smooth enough, maybe C1 is enough, you know. It can be done even more general, but for us, uh, even to say C infinity and rapid decay at infinity is enough. But uh, we have this thing. Uh, this is the cornerstone of uh, Fourier analysis, uh, this Fourier integrals. Uh, so now, but we have to apply this to a suitable function. So we have to see to what function we can apply. So in this case, actually, we can write this function, uh, can write this. So you see, chi is a periodic function, right? So uh, then uh, this thing, is, yeah, so, yeah, so, so in order to see what kind of function we need, we can write this in the following form, the chi, because it has to appear on one side of the equation and the other side would be the uh, theta at inverse parameter and so on. So theta chi t, we can write it as uh, a double sum Yeah, so we can write it as yeah sum uh, over this group of uh, the the, the um, over Z n pi alpha because these are all the only distinct values uh, it's periodic with respect to n and then the interior sum is L belonging to Z, e to the minus, so here comes e to the minus pi times uh, Lx plus alpha squared. And then there's T. So this suggests that the need to uh, apply uh, Poisson summation to the following function. So we have to take F of X, equal to e to the minus pi lx plus alpha squared t. So again, uh, like the theta function, it's a Gaussian, uh, but shifted and rescaled. Uh, so there is a shift, and it is rescaling depending on L. Yeah, there is an L there. So, but the, the, the Fourier transform of this is easy Using Fourier transform of the Gaussian, you can find Fourier transform of this by, by easy moves. So at T is equal to e to the e pi i t alpha over n over n root t. And then we have got exponential of minus pi t squared over n squared. So yeah, there, there are these features, of course, of one over t here appearing instead of t, the parameter t. Uh, 
and uh, but there is this factor and um, yeah there is this n root t um okay so I'm not sure I got this right actually so yeah, f of x should be equal to e to the minus. Uh, so the, the, I apply this to um, x n. Sorry, this is wrong. But there is no l here, right? Okay. So um, now then uh, there is some work involved. Actually, you can show that. If um, beyond uh, being an even character, we have to assume that it is also primitive. I'll tell you what primitive means. Let me show that if chi is primitive and even, of course, as before, then uh, you get uh, the, the following uh, Functional equation for theta chi. Then we get the functional equation that theta chi of t is equal to chi hat uh, uh, is equal to g chi over n root t theta chi bar of one over n squared t. That's the right side of this portion summation formula. Now, what is this g chi? This g chi is, uh, it depends on the character, of course. This is just uh, sum of, um, Right, this g chi is just um, um, sum of um, pi alpha e to the two pi i alpha over n alpha belonging to z n. Yeah. It's almost like Fourier transform of the character chi itself, calculated at one, something like that, yeah. I believe this is called Gauss sum, but I'm not sure. So the interesting thing now is that the functional equation here is more, much more complicated than the usual theta function because we have theta chi and theta chi bar, and there are these factors of n and this. Then uh, we just sub into this. Then we just write. Uh, we use again Mellin transform that I wrote. So we have this pi to the power s minus s over two, gamma of s over two, and then L of s chi is equal to, of course, there is this integral from zero to infinity, the corresponding thing on the right-hand side. So um, theta chi t over two, and then we have got here t to the s uh, over two, dt over t, times that. And now we break this into two pieces as before, as in the case of Riemann zeta function. So, but these two pieces are one of them is one over zero to one over n because this thing here plus integral one over n to infinity. And we can change this again to this integral by doing uh, t to one over n t uh, factorization, I mean, uh, change of variable. And once you do that, then you use this functional equation Oh, sorry, this functional equation, then you get the functional equation for um, 
for uh, L function, which is L of S. So maybe I'll just write it like this. Function equation that you get is the following. So we get n to the power s over two uh, pi to the power of minus uh, one half s over two, sorry. Yeah, more of s over two L of S chi. That's equal to epsilon of chi. N over just replace now s by one minus s, right? And over one minus s over two pi one minus s negative one minus s over two and gamma of one minus s over two then times L of one minus s and chi bar which is chi inverse, of course. Yeah, so this is the, uh, yeah, functional equation again. Essentially, S is uh, gets replaced by one minus S, but there is this important epsilon factor here, which is actually given by um, epsilon of chi. This is given by root n over, um, the Gauss sum for chi bar, I believe. Yeah. And uh, this has uh, absolute value of root n uh, can be shown. So the absolute value of this guy is one. Um, so this is for, uh, this is functional equation for even primitive characters. Now, I told you I will define also, I should define also what, what we mean by primitive character. I mean, the idea is this. So what is primitive character? Well, it could happen that uh, sometimes there is a smaller integer m1. So there exists m1 smaller than n and a character. I one character modulo M one. Such that uh, chi actually uh, is given by chi one even. Such that chi is equal to chi one. So if this chi, your character can be obtained uh, by a character modulo a smaller integer, this is called uh, imprimitive. Chi is called imprimitive. And the smallest such n, such n one rather, such that you can find it from, you can find your, you can define your character via characters with the smaller uh, n's. It's called the conductor of n. So this is n. But if there is no such a smaller n one, in other words, if it is not in primitive, then it is called primitive. So that's the definition of primitive. Okay, now here we also assume that uh, pi is even, but what, what we do for pi r, we want to do, we want to see what happens in the case of pi r. So in other words, chi of negative n is negative chi n. Well, as I said, I mean, this theta, theta chi uh, t that we define is zero. Uh, but then there is an alternative uh, choice for that. Then use uh, theta chi. 
t is equal to sum by um, n root t and belonging to z. But this makes it uh, this makes the thing even now, but we have to multiply by this factor uh, e to the minus pi n squared t. So pi n squared t. So I won't write the functional equation for this. Uh, uh, actually, I don't remember right now, but this is very well known since. Uh, uh, at least the work of Heike in 1920, where he put all these things into great uh, a machine he invented. And uh, then you get functional equations for L functions. So he got functional equations for Dirichlet L functions and for Dedekind zeta functions by introducing uh, appropriate classes of theta functions. So this is a very general idea. I mean, Basically, now uh, any kind of arithmetical or motivic L functions, um, if you want to show that they have functional equation and analytic continuation, even before that, um, a good way is to show that they can be obtained from some L functions or uh, modular forms or automorphic forms in general that are defined uh, via representation theory. So, because in that case, it's easier to prove uh, functional equation and analytic continuation of the corresponding L functions. And that's a very general idea. So basically, yeah, I mean, still we don't know how to do that in the case of ordinal functions and many others, but uh, that's, that's a general philosophy to do. So, okay, I mean, I thank you very much for being participant to this course. And uh, there is a lot of uh, stuff that one can discuss, but uh, we are finished for now, but we can dis keep discussing uh, later on after the class. Thank you very much.